people were going to be talking about and following for, for months and years to come. And it also began to emerge just how important a role model Dennis was in his home community, for other Aboriginal youth, and I think that made his death uh, even more monumental. You know, I think it's important. I've been posted in many detachments, I think 13 in my 35 years, three of them being in Alberta, the rest here in uh, Manitoba. Working on my home reserve for four years was a challenge. Uh, each uh, community that I've gone to, whether it's my home community or an uh, isolated post of Puckatawagan, Cross Lake, Waiwisa Capo, Roseau River, 
Nelson House. Each place was unique in its own ways. I always found that if I engaged the people of the community, it made my job a lot easier. As a policeman, I felt that was very important for me. actually kind of came here and he mentioned this tree to me and to his other sibling. And this is where he wanted to be. This is me in the back row looking out for all these people. So that was one of the reasons he always, I don't know, for some reason, it was just this tree. As soon as we'd come in here, he said it was beautiful, it's peaceful, well maintained. But you know, you don't like to see people like this, you don't want to bring them home to this. But this is the way he wanted, and the community always, like it had a big effect on the community, bringing him home. Like he's always considered Barrows as his home. This was his main place of being. Um, he just really enjoyed and loved being home here, but this was one of the things that he actually, nobody wants to talk about death. Nobody wants to talk about what's gonna happen. But this is what he wanted, and this is what I, I gave it to him. This is what he wanted and where he wanted to be. Oh, geez, that's... <laughs> it's still hard. It's still very hard till this day. Still is. Growing up with knowing this too, it made, made me angry with people because of what they'd done. Then I just gotta learn to become more acceptant of the fact of what they did and it's just, it's not much I can do about it. It's been, but it's been also like, you know, the biggest part for us is her not having her father there with her all her life, you know, and me trying to raise a girl, another one that doesn't have her daddy there, you know, so it's very difficult. I think it's everything. <laughs> She's a splitting image of her dad. I, I always see that, you know, everybody says she looks like me and it's like, where? <laughs> Ed was Dennis's best friend. They played ball together, hockey. They worked at a sawmill together. Yeah, well, this is Corey when she was small, eh? We took this at my place in Barrows, eh? Well, my neighbor, eh? Come and, come and told me what happened to him, eh? So it was about six o'clock in the morning when I heard that, eh? Yeah. And then, well, after that, I, I felt kind of bad about that, eh? Cause he, you were just like my brother, eh? We were, I was always with him, eh? Yeah. And then after that, they brought him home, eh? And I, I carried him in, eh? Into the hall, eh? They come and got me and I carried him in there, eh? And after that, I felt, I used to think about him quite a bit. I used to go up to the graveyard, eh? Walk there every, just about every day to go see the grave, eh? Yeah. Yeah, I really missed him, eh? I was always with him, man. It was in Russell, Manitoba, that evil men came around. They met two policemen who they meant to gun down. That night because I knew him, he was from home. That's the way I am. I just sit down and I start writing the song. And just what I heard, heard happened is what I wrote on. Okay, I'm, I'm Norman McLeod and I'm from Barrows, Manitoba. I knew Dennis Strongkill and he was just a little fella. He lived close to where we lived. I watched him pretty well grow up. Dennis was raised by Joe Janai and Christina Janai. 
And that's about all I know about them. For he was the first policeman to come out of this town. Things we'll remember, like when we played ball together. We were called the Paris Five Stars, and our coach was Cliff O'Neill. And that night at the party, Dennis would sing some songs. I used to like the way he'd imitate old Red Savine. Now he lies. It was extremely hard because my dad was like my best friend. You know, we'd jump in the car, we'd end up in like Mount Rushmore or something like that. That was the one and only person that I could, you know, talk to. At the time when my dad passed, I was, I was already into partying and experimenting with drugs and alcohol. It's been a roller coaster ride, in and out of treatment centers, learning about different programs and how to better myself. I have my meditations in the morning when I walk to school and, you know, when I get up in the, in the morning have that first moment of silence and to think about everything and everything kind of comes together so i wouldn't have been able to to get where i am now though if i hadn't have forgiven robert sand for what he did and that happened like three or four years ago when i decided to go on that journey i'm cooking full time right now and going to school uh, my partner and i are going on eight years this year I take pride in my uniforms and, um, and, and looking good all the time, so <laughs> I, I learned that from my dad, so. It would really mean a lot for me to meet Robert face to face. Um, like I said, we've been in correspondence for years now, and um, it would just um, it would put closure to, to the journey that I've been on. And I'm not saying that this journey is going to be over after meeting him. It's just going to get better and easier. And when I set out to write Robert letters, it was um, I'm, I'm involved with the parole board, so that when anything goes wrong or whatever programs Robert is involved in in prison. Um, they, they give me all that information so I know what's going on with him. So they were the first people that I contacted. I needed to know how to go about, you know, facilitating something like this. Um, and, and right now was to get the letter out. And they got me into contact with Dave Gustafson um, in Langley, BC. And, and that's, how, that's how it all started, was with, through him. So I was ready to forgive and that I'd like to continue, you know, um, go, coming to meet him was, was ultimately the, 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 big, the big thing that's going to be going on. Um, and then this was one of his, this was his response to, um, um, to the letter that I wrote, my first letter. Um, and it starts out with, um, Ricky, I sincerely apologize for not responding to your letter sooner. It was not for a lack of trying. Your letter came as a surprise. And impacted me deeply. I've read out its words over a dozen times and put pen to paper almost as many. You and I have a couple things in common, I noticed after reading your letter. I also haven't missed a single day without thinking about your father, my brother, and everything that happened in those dark days. I've lived a life of many regrets, but the loss of our loved ones and widespread trauma I caused is by far my biggest. I cannot change or take back all the wrong I've done. However, I can become a better man who has much to offer and gives freely to those in need. It sounds like you are doing some work yourself, Ricky. It is not an easy thing, and I wish you, us both, the strength and courage to continue on this path. Let both of our families' futures be full of peace, prosperity, and good health. They deserve nothing less. Sincerely, Robert. Strength and honor. Mike McIntyre, uh, I'm the justice uh, reporter for the Winnipeg Free Press. I've uh, been at the Winnipeg Free Press since 1997 and uh, did my first couple years on the police beat. 
again, when the facts began to emerge in this case of exactly how this played out, that this was an ambush, um, that this was not the police chasing the bad guys, this was essentially the bad guys chasing the police, uh, that really um, underlined just how, how tragic and also unique this case really was. But I think more than anything, this crime spree was born uh, certainly out of desperation, money. Uh, they felt they, they, they needed money, they needed to stockpile weapons. Uh, but also, and I think this is the, the key, and this is what ultimately had to do with the murder of Dennis Strongkull, is an absolute hatred of authority. Um, and, and a feeling that uh, they weren't gonna let, uh, they weren't gonna let anybody, let alone a, a police officer, get in their way. And unfortunately, that manifested itself on the highway that night um, when they crossed paths with, with Dennis Tronkel and Brian Auger. The last week has been pretty eventful, because now I'm AWOL and on the way. Talk to my mother. She sounds worried, and she'd like me to turn myself in and go see a doctor. And as for my dad, well, I'm not sure how he feels. I just hope he can help mother not worry so much. I haven't been able to write for some time, because I left my journal with Dan to give to Mother and Elizabeth to read. So now they've read it. And I'm still alive, and I don't feel comfortable. Well, now I have two traveling partners. My brother Dan, who's sometimes worrisome, and he's very hard to control when he gets going. And of course, I'm with the wonderful Lori. She is so much better now, and so beautiful. We've slept together twice, and she is so good. But other than our sex, our bond is pretty quiet. I think because she don't let off with much, and I let off with less. But her and Dan get along well. They keep each other company. So let's see. I've got too much to download to paper, so I'll just write a summary of the last week. Well, let's see. I run from my halfway house. I've drove a half dozen different trucks. I kicked the shit out of a farmer for his truck, but that was his fault. Because when I couldn't find the keys and he pulled up, I told that all I wanted was his keys, and I was going to get them. I said that no one needs to get hurt. Then he put up a fight, so I kicked him around and took his truck. December 20th, I woke up in a motel with a beautiful woman beside me, and a rifle and sawed off shotgun close, and I felt really good, which is better than two days ago when we robbed the bank and went outside to only have a dye pack go off, which made me mad, because I was so nice to the woman, and to repay me, she throws a dye pack in with my money. So now I've decided on a new approach and it won't be the same, or even very nice. Now we've got so much firepower that if a cop pulls us over, he'll be one sorry motherfucker. And I feel so out of control, because I've set very few rules. So we can do whatever one wanted. We've got money, booze, drugs, and I've got my two favorite people now. Dan is great company, but hard to control, which aggravates me. And then there's Lori. I still have no idea who she is, but at the same time, I'd love to spend my last days with. Well, we've decided not to head west, went with east, which has turned out to be quite a trip. And we've got so much more land to cover, and who can tell where our path will lead? I've seen a crossroads that looked just like the one I use in my mind when I have to choose a path, and I stopped to have a really good look, and I realized that's, that's where I was, at a crossroad. After I had uh, picked up Dennis, uh, we are now on our way to, uh, to Russell on uh, Highway 45. Uh, the Reserve Gaming Center was quiet. I mentioned that to him and I said, well, let's go for our, our coffee and then make our way back. As I was the driver, Dennis was uh, the passenger. And uh, we weren't in a rush to get there. We were probably traveling normal speed, but it started to snow. It was just a light snow at first. In the distance, I had observed the vehicle come off the grid road, but as the vehicle came towards us, it didn't uh, dim its lights. And I thought, well, geez, you know, maybe we should just check just to be sure. As I went to pull to the side, I looked back, I saw the vehicle hit its brakes, and I think, okay, well, the vehicle's gonna pull over. So I turned around, activated my lights, pulled up, uh, behind a truck. The truck was slowing in front of me and uh, looked like it was gonna just pull over. 
As I got behind the vehicle, put my takedown lights, flashing the bright light to the vehicle, and was about to key the repeater to let telecom operator know that we were stopping the vehicle. But at the same time, I noticed somebody had stepped out of the passenger side of the vehicle. It wasn't uncommon that people do get out of their vehicles, but this time I see him get out facing our police truck. Dennis, at the meantime, had opened the door to exit the vehicle. Next thing I, I know, Dennis is yelling at me that we're being shot at. It startled me. I have never been shot at before. And I recall seeing a blast go off the window. And I thought, oh man, this is happening. This uh, somebody's shooting at us. Dennis yelling at me to, to, to back up. I backed away and then I spun around, thinking, okay, this guy should be now jumping in his vehicle and taking off. That time I noticed the vehicle was making a U-turn. I said, well, we gotta head into Russell. And I'm keying the repeater and thinking somehow of my repeater system diverted to another uh, detachment and it turned out I was talking to somebody in Dauphin, didn't recognize the voice saying that we were being shot at, uh, we're heading to, to, to Russell. Now I'm thinking, well, geez, how can this person in Dauphin help me right then and there? We're saying to the telecom that we're on Highway 45, we're heading into Russell, this guy is chasing us, this guy is shooting at us. Being from Russell, I figured probably the best would be to run to the detachment or get to the detachment, because that's our safe home, that's what I thought. I'm probably going 100, 130 kilometers plus in this vehicle, it's right on my tail. I make a couple turns, and I actually hear the glass pellets bouncing off my silent patrolman. And I'm right beside the detachment. I drove through the ditch. And at that time, uh, that vehicle was right there, and it bumped us, pushed us off to the side, plugged up right against the side door, so the passenger side of the door. got out of the vehicle. I don't know whether I was uh, pushed out or uh, scrambled out. I know I got out. Went to the back of the police, the police truck and started shooting. The light on, I can still see the three of them. Took a couple extra shots that was backing away and then it scrambled out and, and took off down Main Street of Russell. I went to the passenger side and I saw Dennis slumped over keeping hole in the back of his uh, patrol jacket. I yelled at him, wake up, get up, moved him. He was slumped over. I don't know whether he, he gurgled or did something. And at that time, I then uh, letting telecoms know that uh, we were at the detachment in Russell, and I needed an ambulance right now. Waiting for the ambulance to arrive, uh, giving description of the vehicle, what direction it was going, hoping that the members in the, in the nearby detachments would be able to, to come out and assist me. I joined this organization, and I had hoped I would never lose anybody or have to shoot anybody. One thing I can say is that I'm proud of this organization that I've spent these years with, knowing that we lost somebody. And everybody that was called out, and what I've heard on the radio, I'm proud of the organization and the people that I've had the opportunity to work with. And knowing that the cavalry was now coming out, we're going to find these guys for what they had done. But I knew these people were still on the road and they were taking the back roads to get out of Russell. Today is the 22nd of December, 2001. The time is 4.19 p.m. Uh, when you get down uh, to the bottom of the hill there where the uh, place is located, the den is located, 
Just give me a quick blast to make sure that we're uh, actually working here, uh, copying you from this distance and with the train. Sarah, over. Black sniper van has some in there. No, yeah. Roger, uh, stand by. We'll pull up the uh, off commander and each one. Here. Okay, we're uh, good to go. 13 miles uh, 10. Is everybody good to go? 23, Roger. 244, good. Up at 10, here, boy. As we get to that green sign, uh, we'll have the dead in sight. We're going to be stopping behind this uh, semi. The semi is a block to hide our vehicle. Roger, copy. Sierra 2, Sierra 3, and Delta 1 are moving into position. Over. Copy. Sierra 1, Sierra 3, and Delta 1 moving into position. Over. Roger, uh, just to advise, uh, Staff Sergeant Burt advises that the, uh, the entire den area has been evacuated. Over. Roger, Sierra 2, Sierra 4, and Alpha 9 moving into position now. Over. Roger, uh, how are you looking there? Uh, if they if they were going to uh, escape, they're going to have to drive through that ditch in a barricade anyway. Uh, are you uh, happy enough to stay in there for the time being? Roger. Okay, and then uh, the snipers, uh, or uh, Sierra 4, can come up and support you there. Your metal storm door, aluminum, possibly a screen and a window. Over. Roger. Uh, be advised that... Uh, Sierra 2 will be deploying onto the roof of the garage and restaurant uh, due west of the den. Roger, copy Sierra 2 deploying onto the roof of the garage restaurant area west of the den. Over. Just observe what appears to be movement in the bottom left-hand corner of the, gear of the window right next to the door. Roger, copy movement bottom left-hand window near the door. face to face. I mean, I just remember his eyes. They just seem lifeless and certainly cold. You know, you hear the expression sort of steely eyes. Well, he had steely eyes. There was sort of a psychopathic element to him. I didn't see, at least at that time, any compassion whatsoever. He wasn't sorry about anything. He was sort of defiant that he had every right to do what he did. Well, as you probably already know, the fellow that was shot and killed earlier this morning or whatever was my younger brother. Yes. Um, I would like to make a phone call uh, to let my mother know. I don't know if she knows or not. Um, I really don't 
care what happens to me. Like, whatever you guys want to know, I'll let you know, but I have things that I want because, uh, Not everybody knows, but I, I uh, have spots in my lungs, and I don't uh, want to go see a doctor. But I would like to uh, spend some time with my fiance until, I don't know, I don't know if this is possible or not, but until tomorrow morning, until we leave, um, I'll give you guys whatever you want to know. I got the sense that this was somebody who was going to go on perhaps a spree if not for the fact that, that he was thwarted when he was. Robert Sand, he didn't care. He wasn't going back to prison without a fight, and he was going to take out anybody who got in his way. Dennis Strongquill probably saved some lives that night by sacrificing his own. It happens, right? You get out of the vehicle and you fire some shots at the police car. Yes. Okay. The police car backs up. You get back in the vehicle, turn around, and you're coming the same way the police car is heading, right? You're following them. You're following them, right. And uh, as, you're, as you said, you eventually end up, you're coming into town, or it looks like you're coming into some kind of town. The police car ends up eventually on the, at the police station, right? There's another confrontation and more shots are fired. But between the first time that you fire shots and, and the last time. time you fire shots with this police car, did you shoot it all while you were following them? I really don't remember, Joe. Okay. I, it's a possibility. Okay. But if it was, it would have been with the shotgun, too. Okay. At any time, did you have the, uh, any other uh, firearm other than a shotgun? We had lots of firearms. Oh, but were you using any other firearm other than a shotgun? I don't think so. Okay. All the shotguns were in the truck. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if there was any other one in there. <clears throat> At any time, did the thought come to, holy shit, let's get, let, let's get my brother some medical attention? Did it, we, did it appear that bad, or? I looked, well, after we were in the hotel room, or just before the hotel room, after all this stuff had calmed down, my fiance called her mother, who's a nurse, and uh, asked her some questions or something, but I think the phone went dead. And then when we got to the hotel room, I looked at it. He was, uh, he seemed all right. He was in pain. Uh, all the bullet wounds had exit wounds. Uh, uh, they all look superficial. Like there's one in his arm and I know Shots in the arm can't really kill you unless they're infected. And there was one in his shoulder blade that looked like it went in and come out mm -hmm. four inches later. Okay. Excuse me, uh, Joe, can I talk to you outside there for a minute? Please? Sure. Lori Bell, she's an interesting character, of course, in all this because her lawyer tried to paint her as just this unwitting accomplice who was just kind of along for the ride, really didn't know what these brothers were, were capable of. Almost naive, impressionable young woman infatuated with love of Robert who, who just was in the wrong place at the wrong time. That was their take. Had them to be together for a while, and uh, they were then going to be uh, separated again, and then Rob wanted to uh, give us a statement, which it's uh, his doing, uh, it was his suggestion, and uh, we said we think we can work something out, and we have. It was kind of pathetic watching the two of them together, knowing what they had just done. You know, it was just like watching two sappy lovebirds, you know, making googly eyes at each other. You know, to see them in that moment, if you didn't know the backstory, if somebody just showed you the video of them together and you didn't know any of the context of what they had done, you'd probably look at that and say, oh, there's just a couple of young kids in love. So it was almost unsettling in that sense because how could they be acting this way knowing the circumstances now that had brought them together there? It was just, it was bizarre. Mm -hmm. okay. 
Well, the prosecutor in the trial was, was the best uh, we had in the province at the time. Uh, Bob Morrison was a dynamic prosecutor, and uh, uh, he certainly pulled no punches, as, as we would have expected. Very emotional, very bombastic, and certainly some of his questioning of witnesses, some of his, his appeals to the jury were... Um, uh, you could tell that this was something that he found just so distasteful. The other thing is the, the defense here, um, in those early days of the trial, there was a push here to try and do away with the first degree murder charge. Now in Canada, um, murdering a, or killing a police officer in the line of duty that's not sort of accidental, there carries with it the presumption that it's a first degree murder, that there's that special protection afforded to police. The defense lawyer here for Robert San Greg Brodsky, he made a motion to do away with that first degree charge. He asked me to act for him, uh, and I did. I thought he was a very intense uh, young man. He said that he wanted to plead guilty to the charge on condition they dropped the charge against Lori Bell. Uh, he wanted uh, to ensure that everybody understood that she was asleep in the back seat of the car. Uh, that was his version of events. Uh, at the time of the shooting, the Crown obviously had a different view. The fact that uh, she wasn't asleep in the back of the car because as she said to Rose Ferguson, just prior to the shooting, she was yelling, kill him, kill him, to Robert Sand. Um, you know, just looking at him every day in the courtroom, he just struck me as such a cold, dispassionate, um, human being that uh, the, the anger was palpable coming off him and that of course would ultimately play itself out near the very end of the trial when Robert Sand leaped out of the prisoner's box uh, he was shackled but he managed to to uh, elevate himself enough and, and ended up landing on his own lawyer or his lawyer's assistant. Knocked a number of people down and tried to uh, uh, cut my junior's Throat. Just absolute chaos in the courtroom with sheriff's officers rushing in, people yelling and screaming. Uh, what we didn't know immediately is that Robert Sand had smuggled a razor blade into the courtroom. The Crowns thought that he was trying to take a hostage, but who knows? In any event, he apologized to my junior before uh, the case was over. This is an unusual combination, Danny and Robert Sand and Lori uh, Bell. I don't know that that kind of combination would ever be repeated. One thing is the, they didn't have shotguns in police cars. There was no shotgun in this car. There should have been. It was after this case uh, man mandated that shotguns should be in all police cruiser cars. Bulletproof vests were mandated. Constable Strongfield was not wearing a bulletproof vest. The holster that uh, Constable Strongcrow was wearing was made for a right-handed person. Uh, he was a left-handed person. What he was presented with at the time of necessity was a club instead of a gun because he couldn't get it out of his holster. When he did get it out of his holster, uh, the magazine fell out uh, and was on the floor. The one bullet that was left uh, in the chamber uh, couldn't be fired. Nobody knows why. It's awful of the things that went wrong. Of course, you also have to, to keep in mind, and this is something as a journalist, I'm always reminding myself that we're dealing with, I mean, this is not a movie, this is not a video game, this is real life. These are real people with families and, and communities. Uh, so you always try and, and handle these things with as much compassion, respect as possible. Fuck it up. 
That is the first time for me hearing that, and that is very difficult for me to hear. Just knowing that he was at home an hour before that. Well, this is very important for the community to put in for your father is because he loved baseball. The baseball diamond was here. For him to remind him of who he was, when he was younger, it was all about ball. Every weekend, your dad would, he would go everywhere with everyone. But over the years, you'd probably hear more stories about that. But this is one of the gifts that, I guess, a town, um, our community, did for him to honor him and to have that respect for him. I attended uh, the first, the very first hearing. Uh, it was something that I needed. I needed to see who did it. I needed to be there and look them in the eye and to show them what they had done, uh, what they left behind. And I had my daughter, Corey, there also with me. And my sister and my aunt came along with me also just to support. I didn't attend to the whole trial because that was more than enough that I had seen. I just didn't want to be there. I didn't, I needed to know who they were, but I didn't want to be there through the whole trial. I don't think I could have put myself through that. Ignorant, just the way they were looking, like it was, this was nothing to them. They sat there and they smiled in that box. And when I was looking at them, that's what they were doing. They were smiling. When it comes to forgiving them, I don't think I'm quite ready to do it versus Thinking like, what would my dad want? Would he want me to forgive them? Or, or what, like, I don't know. It's hard to explain, but it's just. I can't explain my anger to those people. It's just there. It's only getting worse and worse. Angrier and angrier the more I figure things out. perspective if that's the choice they want to make uh, I'm glad for them from my standpoint I don't need to meet him whatsoever I'll go through my life knowing what he did I'm happy for how the family reacts how they're gonna deal with it that's I'll let the family deal with it that way Ricky I've met uh, I keep in contact with Joey 
uh, Teresa I keep in contact with. The first wife um, I've kept in contact with her. Um, when this was happening, I told her I wanted more to be, be about Dennis. I, I guess my only wish would be is that we as members out there be able to uh, communicate and engage our community people. They know who we are. They know we have a job to do. So Lori Bell's sentencing was manslaughter, which she was convicted of. I mean, it can run the gamut. You could be sentenced to no jail time all the way up to life. It, it really is the charge that has the widest disparity of sentence. Unlike Robert Sand, I mean, she, you know, there were tears, there were, and were there tears, were they remorseful tears or were they, I'm sorry I got caught and my life is ruined kind of tears. Who knows what the future has in store for Robert Sand, does he ever get out? I have my doubts. I think a lot of people in Canada, they assume that everybody gets out. Well, that's not true. Our prisons are actually filled with quote unquote lifers. They tend to be people who were convicted of first degree murder. First degree murder is a pretty rare conviction in this country. Uh, it's, it's hard to get, you know, you have to prove premeditation, sort of a cold bloodedness to it. Um, it, it, it there aren't a lot of first degree murder convictions on a yearly basis in, in Winnipeg. Like you could count on one hand if that. My understanding is Robert Sand has been far from a model inmate. There's been issues. There will probably continue to be issues. So when he gets to 2026 and he's able to, to ask the parole board, does he actually get released? I, I wouldn't necessarily put money on it. Um, for Ricky Strunkel to get to a point in his life where he realized this is not healthy for me. I need to take the steps for me. This wasn't about Robert. This wasn't about um, anything but a man who had obviously had a real rough go in his life, deciding that this is something he needed to, to do. And it's remarkable. It, it truly is. And it's, it's a rarity and it's refreshing. I came to know Ricky some time ago when he wrote a letter to the prisoner, Robert, uh, saying that it was time for him to move on and to get rid of the rage and the grief and the, the anger that he felt for so long that was consuming him. Nice to meet you. Good, good to see you. <laughs> you too. Welcome to Abbotsford. Yes, thank you, yeah. It's going to be first quite time. a day. Yeah, first time in Abbotsford. Yeah? You steeled for this? You ready for this? Yeah, I am. Yeah. All right. Yeah. It's been a long time coming. Yeah, a few years now, eh? Yeah. Yeah. So, I've got a car out in the parking lot. Okay. And we'll just, if you're ready for this, we'll yeah. just head straight there. All right. And today I'm not acting as an ED, I'm acting as a facilitator in a restorative justice process that will involve uh, the youngest son, a uh, family survivor of homicide in a murder case that happened many years ago, and the man responsible for the harms in that family at a local prison. Uh, both men are looking forward to a particular healing day, and I'm anticipating a really helpful outcome for both of them by the time this time is over.
this one was a cakewalk, really, um, in the sense that both of them wanted to meet. Uh, it was really just a matter of, uh, of talking to the institution about um, a suitable day and a suitable place and making sure that Ricky was cleared through all the bureaucratic procedures that it takes to get into a federal prison. I think anyone who witnessed it would be astonished that there wasn't more anger or outrage or hurt, more emotion. Um, and yet it's not for me to say what it should be, so I just kind of support them and facilitate the conversation. So, you're one of a double handful of people that have done this, Ricky, <laughs> over the last many years. Yeah. How do you feel it went? It was definitely um, liberating. It's just light and like a load is off and, you know, and it was, it was pretty amazing experience. So, you know, you told me that I was going to discover a very gentle man and I did, you know, he definitely, definitely took a change for the better, you know. Um, yeah, I tried not to oversell him. I wanted you to experience him for yourself. Mm -hmm. Were there any surprises? Um, <clears throat> no surprises, no. Well, like I told Robert, I said, I'm done with it. I'm absolutely done with it. And we don't need to talk about, you know, about those dark days, you know? And we didn't, we, we, we mentioned a few things. The only format is past, present, future. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about the fact pattern, what, what led to the, you know, to the harms, mm -hmm. what was the incident? Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe, I mean, we, we frequently have, in cases like yours, mm -hmm. people wanting to know what what was going on in your life that shaped and formed you into the outlaw you became? Mm -hmm. And in Robert's case, I mean, there's lots. Mm -hmm. you know, we often talk about the ways that the crime itself is like, has a ripple effect and touches so many people. Mm -hmm. When in the case of a murder, you know, what, 50, 60 people probably minimum mm -hmm. within that family context in, you know, in concentric circles mm -hmm. out from the principles. But there's something about this process that enables that to, at least in some degree, for the ripples to go out and touch and heal people too. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to overstate the case. You know, it's too easy to oversell your own baby, but man, we've seen some remarkable things over time. When we first got into the park here, I was, I did a quick little meditation and, and looked up and saw an eagle, you know, and you know, my dad's Indian name was the Eagle Man. And um, the message I got from that was, everything is going to be okay. I definitely feel that he would be proud, you know, however you want to heal uh, and, and, and you've been thinking about it, then just do it because it's, it's so much more rewarding than, than a life of hate and resentment. So I've always been one to, to say that there's no such thing as peace in this world for all the stuff that goes on, but I, I can honestly say that I feel, feel at peace right now. <laughs> and it's, it's a good feeling. <laughs> I feel like I need to give you a hug on all the right. way out. Is that all right? <laughs> yeah, it's all right, yeah. I always ask. <laughs> no, you don't have to ask. <laughs> Take good care of you. You too, thanks. You're a fine man, Ricky Strongwell. Thank you. Got lots of time for you. Thanks. at the gaming center just to walk through. Give me uh, 10 minutes, please. Hello, hello. Hello, Ralph. Hello, Charlie. That's it. Hello. We're not gambling. You're working tonight? What's that? You're working tonight? Yes. Oh. Who's the big winner? <laughs> no, I, I can't play. <laughs> All right, we'll uh, we'll make our way out. That's it. Uh, have a good night. Hello. How are you? Where's your money? Lend me, lend me twenty.
you know, uh, meeting the people in the, in the gaming center, um, the laugh, the jokes, uh, makes my day and it makes their day, I think. Because okay. um, I come in here and when I'm off duty, I'll come and gamble a little bit and I'll chit chat with them. And uh, sometimes uh, if there's an intoxicated person, I'll go up to them and say, look, you're not supposed to be here. And they'll, they'll get up and they'll walk out and okay. we won't have any problems. But uh, to see the interaction with the people and the, the laughter and the smile, that, that's what makes my day and uh, being able to do that. So. I feel, I feel good. It was in Russell, Manitoba, that evil men came around. They met two policemen who they meant to gun down. That night it was evil men chasing cops down. Right in the police compound where they gunned Dennis down. We will always remember that cold day in December when a great grown model was cruelly shot down. Yes, he was a role model for our kids of tomorrow. For he was the first policeman to come out of this town. Like when we played ball together, we were called the Paris Five Stars, and our coach was Cliff O'Neill. And that night at the party, Dennis would sing some songs. I used to like the way he'd imitate old Red Slavine. Now he lies in the graveyard. There in the hill Where things are so peaceful For him things stand still Today we honor you, Dennis And oh yes, we will Name this ballpark Dennis Strongwill Today we honor you, Dennis, and oh yes, we will name.